Call a meeting to order. It is six o'clock, and this is the City of Canton Council meeting, April 18th, 2019. If you would please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good. Henry Val. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for all the good things that are around us, for this city that has so many things to offer, for our citizens. We ask that you be with our public servants and with us here tonight. All these things we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, the first item that we have uh, is to approve the agenda. We'll, I would like to make one amendment to the uh, uh, agenda uh, by removing we will not need an executive session, item 14 on the agenda. Um, and I do, I will add a, a second proclamation uh, under uh, guests and visitors as item D that we'll go over at the time, proclamation item D. Anyone else have any changes, corrections? Motion to approve as amended. Second. I have a motion, uh, Mr. Uh, Bill approved it. Jack seconded the motion. He made the motion. Jack seconded it, okay. All right, next item. <clears throat> Public hearing. Uh, uh, today we have is to an amendment on the development code. Steve's going to explain exactly what that is. Uh, I, I, we've talked about that before, and it really was something that was, I think, inadvertently left out as far as the appeals process from some of the uh, uh, various boards that we have. Okay. Well, in 2000 or in 2016, the staff started working on a list of changes to the Unified Development Code. One of the changes that the city attorney asked for was to amend some language in the appeals process from the Board of Zoning Appeals in the, in the Construction Board of Adjustments. They wanted the language by writ of certiorari in there that would go to Superior Court. So that was put in the list of proposed changes. That was 2016. In 2017, Mayor and Council added the language to the appeals that the first avenue of appeal from someone that was aggrieved by a decision from the Board of Zoning Appeals or the Board of Construction was to come to Mayor and Council. We go back to what was started in 2016 that never got approved until 2018. Um, staff had um, forgot that was in there as one of the one of the amended changes. So the 2017 amendment to the appeals process got approved. We carried forward the list of changes that was started in 2016 and that was approved in 2018. Well, that still contained the language of deleting the appeal process. So that got taken out. And what we have now was a little uh, a fractured appeal process in the code. This amendment will put the language as it was approved in 2017 back into the appeal process where someone is aggrieved by a decision, they come to you guys first and you make the decision whether to, he to hear the appeal or not. If you don't hear it, then it goes to Superior Court. Did this only affect those two areas? Or, I, or did uh, does our... Uh, uh, don't we have other areas that you can appeal directly uh, to the uh, council? Or not directly, but after something? Well, um, no, I think this was the only one. That's the only two? Right. We the, added it, yeah, we added it for Board of Appeals was the only thing we added. Okay. Because zoning, um, rezoning's already come to you, so. Right. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, open the public hearing regarding that. Uh, amendment to our development code or is there anyone who would like to speak regarding that? 
Okay, that's pretty pretty quick. So we'll close the public hearing and and uh, we'll open it up for the council discussion and possible action on this uh, amendment to the development code, chapter 105, section 105.14.0 and section 105.14.03. Move to approve. Second. Okay. Mr. Yon made the motion. Mr. Grant seconded the motion. Any other discussion? If not, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. All members voting for the motion. Uh, that would be <clears throat> three, four. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, on guests and visitors, we we'll have a presentation of the fiscal year 2018 CAFR. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, we have with us tonight uh, Clay Pilgrim, which is an audit partner at Russian and Company. They've completed the fiscal year 2018 comprehensive annual financial report. Uh, you, before you, you have a short presentation that Mr. Uh, Pilgrim will be going over, and you also have a copy of the full, complete CAFR in front of you. Um, I would like to mention, as I'm sure he will, if you have any questions, please feel free to let us know either tonight or, or within the next few days if you have any questions on that CAFR. Okay. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for having Rushton & Company back uh, as your auditor for fiscal year 2018. Uh, as Mr. Ingram mentioned there, you have, should have four different documents in front of you there. You have a bound presentation, which will be on the screen as well, and I'll be going, most of my time will be spent in this bound present presentation. You should also have uh, the actual full CAFR, and then you would also have two letters there with you um, uh, at, your, at your seat there. Um, I'm going to spend most of my time in this presentation here. Of course, if you have any other questions, as Mr. Ingram mentioned, I'm happy to answer today or, or in the future as well. All righty. Before I get started too, too deep into the numbers, I wanted to first um, thank you all and thank all of your staff, uh, Mr. Ingram, Mr. Peppers, the entire, uh, all department heads, and all staff members for the City of Canton really helped us uh, throughout the audit process, very smooth audit process. Had no issues, no delays. Uh, it, it, the, the entire process went very smoothly. So uh, I commend you all for that and thank you for that. Okay, uh, the first uh, page of the, of the presentation there, you'll note uh, we talk about our audit opinion. Our independent auditor's report is found in, on pages one and two of the bound uh, comprehensive annual financial report. Uh, that letter, as always, details what the city of Canton's responsibilities are. Of course, these financial statements are the responsibility of, of the City of Canton's management. Uh, it, it details what our responsibilities are as your independent auditors. Of course, we are responsible to give an opinion on those financial statements that those are free of material misstatement. Uh, we follow government auditing standards as required uh, during our audit process. And I'm pleased to present that for fiscal year 2018, we have an unmodified or clean, uh, unqualified, you used to hear it called, opinion on the financial statements. Nothing came to our attention during the audit process that would uh, prohibit us from issuing an unmodified opinion. All right, the next slide there. I always call your attention to these uh, couple statements at the front of the CAFR, as these are the only two statements in the CAFR that bring all activities of the city together in one. So you all probably spend a lot of time throughout the year looking at your general fund, uh, maybe look at your SPLOS fund, paying some attention to the water fund. But these particular, these two statements, which is your statement of net position, which is found on pages 12 and 13, and the statement of activities, which is found on page 14, are the only two statements in this entire report that bring all activities together in one. Um, the statement of net position is going to be similar to a balance sheet, whereas the statement of activity is going to be similar to an income uh, for a business enterprise. All right, a few numbers from those statements. Uh, if you flip to the next slide there, uh, we've got net position and the change in net position, and we've got a five-year history there for you. You'll note there, for fiscal year 2018, uh, the city had a net investment in capital assets of $118,976,924. That is going to be your capital assets, land, buildings, equipment, less the accumulated appreciation on those assets, less any debt outstanding that was used to acquire those assets. Uh, on a restricted net position, which is going to be external resources like SPLOST, 
unspent SPLOS proceeds, those sorts of things. Those are restricted uh, restricted items. You had two million three seventy nine two ninety three. Unrestricted net position of nineteen million nine ten nine fifty one gets you to your total net position of one forty one two sixty seven one sixty eight. You'll note there in comparing that one with the prior year, there was an increase in net position this year of nine million one thirty eight two four. We, we've got to note there that the variances on all those different years, those five years there, largely are caused by um, capital grants and contributions as grants, you know, timing of grants is mostly what causes the fluctuation in your um, change in net position over those. I mean, there's other, other different changes as well, but the, the most significant change there from year to year is going to be capital grants and contributions. <clears throat> all right, your general fund. Um, for fiscal year 2018, revenues of the general fund increased 1,431,173, or about 11.5%. A few items that contributed to that cause, um, or to that increase, were uh, property tax revenues, those increased 385,889. Your title ad valorem tax, TAVT tax revenues, they increased 154,311. Uh, insurance premium tax revenues increased 105,714. Uh, building permit fees um, increased 596,829. Your planning and development fees increased 133,793. So those uh, building permit and planning development fees increasing is a promising sign there. On the expenditure side, expenditures increased 215,267, or about 1.5%. Uh, there were other items that, that, that attributed to some of that increase and we had some others that decreased but a lot of that was reclassification there was some departmental changes that sort of thing uh, during fiscal year 18 but the largest uh, cost for the increase was building inspection expenditures those increased 204 471 that was mostly under the per personal services line item all right your unassigned fund balance I always uh, when I present to you talk to you about your unassigned fund balance which um, as of course I always talk about there's five different types of fund balance uh, in the general fund um, and so we always talk about the unassigned fund balance, which is your residual net position or re residual fund balance available for spending really at the board's discretion. And it's a lot of times what's used for what, what in the market we call uh, reserve. Um, and so that calculation is done various different ways, but a lot of times we look at unassigned fund balance. So for fiscal year 18, the unassigned fund balance of the general fund was 118,083 or 0.8% of expenditures, which is about 0.1 months. Not to alarm you there, I've actually got the note on here to, to make sure to call your attention there that, that there, there is a, an advance to the SPLOS fund, which you all are aware of, and that is required by governmental accounting standards that we put that as a non-spendable fund balance because it's a long-term receivable. It is from another fund of, of, the, of the city, so uh, no real concern there. But uh, without that $3,670,448 um, advance to the SPLOS fund, uh, your unassigned fund balance would be three million seven eighty eight five thirty one, which is about twenty six percent of expenditures and about three point one months. Uh, so that's a healthy uh, unassigned fund balance in that regard. I think uh, GFOA's recommendation is is two to three months uh, is is uh, sufficient there as far as um, they actually say unrestricted fund balance, which is a completely different calculation, but they're real real similar in in regard to the general fund. You'll note there for fiscal year 17, that was uh, th that number was 3,152,290, or about 22% of expenditures to about 2.6 months. <clears throat> this next slide is a graphical depiction of the revenues and expenditures in the general fund. You'll note there fiscal year 18 revenues 13,847,894 eight and expenditures were 14463573 This would not include any other financing sources or uses like transfers to or from other funds. Those are kind of below the line uh, on the general fund. The next slide is a graphical depiction of that fund balance I was just referring to there, uh, with the blue line being the total fund balance, 4175420 and the green line being the unassigned fund balance, 118,083 uh, for fiscal year 18. Okay, a few things from your water and sewer fund. Um, during fiscal year 18, operating revenues of the water and sewer fund increased 1,980,554, or about 14.6%. Uh, 
<coughs> contributing to that increase were water fees. Those increased 309, 301. I will say that's about a 5.5% increase, but um, just to break that down further, uh, on under water fees, that includes your charges, water charges, which those increased 206,899, or about 4.1%. And then you had tap fees, uh, water tap fees, that increased 102,402, which is about an 18% increase there. Under the sewer fees, those increased 1,604,776, which is almost 21%. Uh, the largest part of that increase was in sewer tap fees, and that was a one million five forty six four twenty two. So a large increase there on the tap fees, which uh, should lead to future uh, charges uh, in that regard, as far as uh, sewer charges. Sewer charges for fiscal year eighteen increased fifty eight three fifty four, about one percent. All righty, on the operating expense side, those increased three hundred nine one forty five, or about four point seven percent. Uh, contributing to those increases were your cost of sales and services increased a little over $150,000, and your depreciation expense increased 157,141. Um, interest expense fiscal year 18 227,608 versus 254,535 at the for fiscal year 17. Uh, just like I talked about unassigned fund balance. Of course, that's a different basis of accounting in the general fund than we have in the water fund, as the water fund is full accrual. But your unrestricted net position, which would be a net of your all your capital asset items, or basically your residual net position of the water fund for fiscal year 18, 13 million seven hundred seven fourteen versus six million four seventy four zero twenty eight for fiscal year 17. Our next slide is a graphical depiction of those operating expense and revenue numbers we just talked about there. Um, and it's also got the, the, res or the net, basically net operating income there. Your operating revenues, as you'll see there, 15504728 Operating expenses were 8619286 Leads you to a net operating income of 6885442 for fiscal year 18. All right, next slide, I always call your attention to sometimes we have two, sometimes we have three different auditor's reports in the, in the CAFR. Uh, for this year, we just have two, the one I referred to earlier with the independent auditor's report, and then we've got our report on internal control, compliance, and other matters. Um, this is where we test and review the uh, internal controls and processes in place for the city of Canton and also uh, look at um, any compliance requirements as well. Uh, pleased to present this year we had no material weaknesses and one significant deficiency that we noted in the controls. Uh, we had no instances of material noncompliance um, in the controls or compliance uh, matters. That is found, that letter is found on pages 107 and 108 of the CAFR. That third letter I was referring to there was not required for this year's CAFR in that we did not perform a single audit this year as the city did not expend $750,000 of federal dollars uh, during fiscal year 18. So we weren't, we did not perform a single audit during this uh, fiscal year. All right, a few items. I always like to keep you um, abreast of the changes that are coming and the changes that have taken place during this year's financial statements and those that are coming uh, down the pipeline, a few of which I have <laughs> talk to you about for several years here and we'll be talking to you about for a few years as one or two are going to be somewhat significant to the uh, accounting of the city's accounting of the city's finances. All right, we did have one change this year on uh, reporting. It was not a significant change. Uh, it could be a significant change if there was ever a, a significant construction project in which it was debt financed um, in the really in the full when we're talking about full accrual basis of accounting is what we're talking about here. Um, Gasby statement number 89, which is accounting for interest cost incurred before the end of a construction period. Um, this statement basically allows you to no longer capitalize interest during construction period. So you no longer, whereas previously you were capitalized or required to capitalize, was calculations involved. For once, we actually have an accounting statement here, standard here that made things a little easier which is not typical of uh, what we're experiencing with Gasby over the number of years here. Uh, but that was early implemented uh, during fiscal year 18. 
Okay, future reporting changes. Uh, I think I've been talking to you about GASB statement number 87 for I know at least one year, possibly two, and it, it's really not required to be implemented until September 30, 2021 for the city of Canton. Uh, but it is going to be a big one. Uh, I think you, you probably recall me last year talking about leases and how they were changing. Um, leases are changing previously or currently now we have um, kind of two approaches for how we account for leases. You've got a capital lease, you've got an operating lease. Capital lease goes on the balance sheet, operating lease is revenue and expense, whether you're less or, or less e. This, this statement is meant to or trying to simplify that into one method of counting for leases. Uh, however, it is going to require some significant implementation. Mostly, the, the first step, I guess, is going to be to round up all your leases because uh, this is going to apply to, to many leases that, that the previous guidance didn't necessarily apply to, like even real estate leases would be applicable here in some cases. So across the board, there's probably no government, whether small or large, who doesn't have at least a lease, copy your lease or some type of lease. So this is going to affect um, going to affect. Uh, most all governments, and it will affect the city of Canton and how to, how to account for this. Um, what it could do, materiality will be uh, a factor in this. In other words, you don't, you don't want to spend uh, a huge amount of time looking at a $100 a month copier lease, but, um, so, so we do have to consider that. But we do have to consider all leases as whether or not they apply here. And, and what it may do is put some leases that were previously not on the balance sheet on the balance sheet. Uh, with an intangible asset. So since what they're really doing here is moving more toward everything being accounted for similar to capital leases, whereas now you've got capital and operating. It's not going to be called a capital lease, but most all leases are going to be cap accounted for in that same manner. There's going to be a lot of implementation guidance. I've already taught two courses on this. Uh, one of my managers, actually manager of this engagement, is teaching a class on this this year at the uh, GGFOA conference. So there's a lot of, lot of guidance out there, and there's going to be a lot of implementation guidance on this one as it becomes effective. Okay, Gatsby statement number 88. This one is effective for this current fiscal year you all are operating in now. This one's really going to try to redefine debt and increase some disclosures and notes for all state and local governments. So there'll be a few additional disclosures in there for debt. Um, that we will assist in implementing when we prepare the CAFR here in this current year. One other item that's, uh, that's also in required implementation for fiscal year 19 that you're currently operating in is some uh, changes to the procurement standards for the uniform, under uniform guidance. So this is going to be procurement of using federal dollars. So any projects or any uh, expenditures of federal dollars required to uh, follow these uh, new uh, required procurement policies and procedures. The good news here is most all of or most of your or your current um, purchasing policies, procurement policies likely are exceeding these thresholds already. So I don't see a great deal of work here in regard to uh, Canton's policies as far as changes are concerned. Any questions I can answer regarding the CAFR or presentation or how do you uh, net investment in capital assets? How is that, how is that, how are those valued? Is that how how do you value those? Okay, so your your that that net investment in capital assets is going to be equity. We're talking about in that regard, and so that calculation of equity, net position, equity, retained earnings. You probably hear those that same thing. Land and, and buildings yes. and everything. So right? the, the calculation of that is land, buildings, equipment, all, all your capital assets, which are all recorded at cost. At, at their cost? At the cost when you purchase it. Mm -hmm. So like you, you buy land for a million dollars, that goes, uh, that's included in this calculation. You buy a building or build a building that's two million dollars, that's included in this calculation. Seems now, a little skewed though, doesn't it? You got something you've had for 15 or 20 years and you bought it for nearly nothing and that looks kind of yes. low, wouldn't it? Now you do include depreciation that comes out of that. So if you, if you have a piece of equipment that goes on the books at $50,000 and it's a a 10-year useful life and you're five years into that, then only half of that would be in that calculation, It'd be net. Appreciation. Appreciation. Now, that does not factor appreciation in there. Uh, as capital assets are required to be accounted for at cost, not at fair, fair value. So that would not include any appreciation. So, yes, land would be a great example. Um, land or even buildings, real estate, would be uh, certainly at this time appreciating rather than depreciating. 
The same would be the, the case in the opposite five or ten, ten years ago. We'd be saying, what about depreciation? Or a, a, and, and that is something that's required to be analyzed for your, for your capital assets is impairment. If you ever have a significant decrease in value, that impairment is required to be accounted for separately. So, so the uh, big difference between FY17 and 18 in the unassigned fund balance is, a, is lo monies that we loan from the general fund to sales tax. Yes, right? sir. That is an advance. Of that sales tax paying it back. And, but yet, is there an indication of how long that would take? How long the how long the, the payback would take? I think that's the the city has one year. Okay. Okay. And that would be all based on collections of SPLOST and other projects you all are planning. That that's all in your capital, you know, how you plan to, to expend your, we, your SPLOST. If we had borrowed if we had borrowed much more, we wouldn't have had much money. At least it wouldn't have shown that way. Right. Cash flow would yeah, ex absolutely. You're exactly right. Okay. And and now Something to consider there, too, is the, the good in that is, of course, you're borrowing from your, yourself and not having to, you know, Understand. borrow from externally. A lot of times with those SPLOS, as, as I think a city has in the past, there will be a bond issue with the SPLOS up front. And so this really saves you from, from doing so there in that case. Yeah, I want to make sure to call attention to that because that looks like our this unassigned fund balance of the city here has dwindled, but in, in all actuality, that's sitting in that's still sitting in fund balance. It's just because it's a long-term receivable, even though it's receivable from ourselves, it is an advance. It is required to be shown as non-spendable because it's not spendable form. Now, this would be different than transferring funds from the water department to the general fund, right? Yes, sir. Because the water funds are not restricted, and sales tax are restricted. Yes. Now, if you advanced, it would still be the same way if you advanced between the, between, between the water fund and the general fund. But, yes, if you're transferring residual net position of the water fund, yeah, that is unrestricted in that regard. Yes, sir. Anyone else have any questions? I had one. Um, I just wanted to verify. You said this one significant deficiency in uh, internal control. That's the same one thing we see every year simply because we have a lower number of employees than uh, – Job functions. Yes, and sir. And and Mr. Peppers and Mr. Ingram and I and our team have actually discussed that at length, and we are we are discussing that, and hopefully that can have, can can be removed. That's been on there for how many years? I mean, I know since we've been doing the audit, um, that's been a a segregation duty. But I, they have implemented processes, and we are making a strides. I think to hopefully remove that. In the next year. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That was not my recommendation. <laughs> I'm only kidding. But, yeah, that, that is I, – I, I don't want you to think that's just something, well, that's going to be there and we're going to be there forever. That's not the – we do evaluate each and, every, each and every year, and we do discuss that. Matter of fact, during our interview process this year, uh, Mr. Peppers brought that to, to our attention that he wants to, to uh, remove that. But, but – in all actuality, yes, sir, that is exactly what that is, and that is a very common organization for this size to, to have that. What employees would it take to eliminate that? I'd have to evaluate it by department. You More thought than. about it? Not long. <laughs> well, very, very briefly, you know, the question would be, you know, utilizing some of our existing personnel to do some other task, even though they may not be in the finance department, which we did that a few years back, took one of those duties. So that may be something we might consider going further without hiring 10 new personnel okay. yeah absolutely yeah there there are ways to um without overworking someone you know putting putting addition, too many additional duties on someone there are methods and, and ways to implement that we can assist and discuss with to try to do so anybody else? uh mr grant oh, on the uh expenditure increase on section was that primary personnel the, the reassignment that we did there um, but that was more than covered. I guess our permits increased almost 600000 and uh, which is great, and planning development fees increased. So we still had a net gain there of That's correct. And, half you a know, million. So. You know, with, the, with your building permit fees, you're, you're technically supposed to spend what you're bringing in in that area. And so if you'll recall a couple years ago, when we did the consolidation with fire services, we kept some staff uh, to do commercial fire inspections. They're in the building department at this time, and so that's where you see some of that increase. Okay. 
and then the purchase of this building was that in 2018 was that 20 2018 it's in this year the final. okay um right now the building is actually in oh, i'm sorry the, pur the purchase of this one wasn't 18, 18. Very easy. the purchase and some of the right. some of the so it's yes. included in <coughs> it's in court yeah. right okay yeah that was largely the the advance we were discussing that moment because that was largely oh, okay. um why that advance was due to the SPLOS funds had not yet come in, so. We moved into the building September 1st, I think. Yeah. Right, right. So that's included in here, which is even better news, I guess. So thank you. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Clay, thank you. Very good report. Well, thank you so much. Uh, there, in those two letters you have there, one of those, um, uh, one of those letters is some required communications that I am required to communicate to you all rather than going through those here in the meeting, uh, as, as I mentioned to the mayor earlier, most all, everything in there is boilerplate information that does not change from year to year. And if there were items in there that were different this year, that would be a bad thing. And I would be discussing those with you. That'd be like difficulties dealing with management or complications during the audit process. And we have none of that to report. So um, I won't go through all those specifics this year but I am happy to answer any additional questions. And, and if there's questions that come about after I leave over the next few weeks, we'll get them by all means, or throughout the year, by all means, please reach out to us. And I know we, we communicate throughout the year, Mr. Stringer and I do, but uh, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions at any time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you all. It. Okay. <clears throat> next time we have is, is uh, Chief Tim Prather is going to, give us an update on our fire services for the city of Canton. Chief, welcome. Thank you, Mayor <clears throat> and Council, uh, for allowing me time on your agenda tonight to come before you. And I'd like to say it's always a pleasure to come over here and, and speak to y'all. So I, I enjoy coming over here. What I have for you tonight is our annual report for 2018, uh, what we did in the fire department and our our service throughout the county. Uh, this year, I know some of the council may not know where we've came from over the years. And me and the mayor was talking a few minutes ago, back when he was in the county on uh, what we had then. And we've come a long way. So I just wanted to give you just a brief overview of our history. You know, prior to 1970, you know, even today as a fire service, we're, we're new as far as fire service tradition. We're less than 50 years old. You know, back in 1970, 71 is when the volunteer departments in the county <clears throat> first started operating. Uh, now, my dad, some of you know my dad was a fire chief at Jasper, and he used to talk a lot with the fire chief here in Canton. So I know Canton's fire service goes back, I think, well before that. But uh, I don't know the whole history of Canton. But for the county, you know, we had nothing basically prior to 1970. You had Georgia Forestry, and that was it. You know, you had a fire out in the county. I guess they'd sent a tractor out there and plow around it. I don't really know what they've done. That's uh, what we did up where I live. But back in 71 is when it all started. It started down in the south end and eventually brought forward about 16 volunteer, separate independent volunteer fire departments in the 70s. In uh, 1973, the citizens in the southwest corner of the county voted in the fire tax. And that's when Oak Grove Fire Department, uh, the county hired the first paid firefighters in this county. And then 1980, over on the east end of the county, the Little River Fire Department uh, became paid. They had volunteers, but it became, uh, they started paying firefighters to be in that station. And then uh, in 1980, <clears throat> that, was, that was Little River, yeah. In 1990, uh, we consolidated those two fire departments, and then the Cherokee County Fire and EMA, our fire and rescue was generated. And then 1999, it went to a countywide vote for the fire tax, and the, and the citizens voted in by referendum to implement the fire tax countywide. <coughs> Next challenge we got handed to us was in 2003 when the uh, Board of Commissioners elected to do away with contracted private ambulance service, and they put the ambulance service in the operation of the fire department. And that was very challenging for us, but I can stand for you, before you today and tell you that was one of the best moves the county ever made. It, it, it was some challenges and struggles, but we got through it, and today it really works well. In 2008, we brought the first ladder company into the county. We'd never seen a ladder, and that was new for us. In 2012, 
was the first time that we tried to get a countywide ISO rating. We had several, with 16 volunteer incorporated fire departments, we had several ISO ratings throughout the county. So in uh, 2012, we went for a countywide rating, and that's when we got the class 5-9. In 2013, we realized in 2012, our training areas where we hurt the worst. So in 2000, we'd already actually begin the process around 2011 to build that training center. So in 2013, we opened that training center. So once we got it open and operating, they wouldn't give us credit while it was under construction in, in 2012. So as soon as we got that thing open and running, we called them back in 2013. <clears throat> and uh, that's when we got our, our 2014, that's when we got our class 3-3Y ISO rating. And then 2017 is when we had the consolidation with, with you here in the city, uh, in the county. And that, that was a very easy transition, more than I expected. That worked really well to get that completed. And I, I found we got a report this week that every firefighter that we brought over from the city, we are 100% complete of getting the training up to, uh, for each, each rank that we have. They, they've all completed their training 100%. So we're proud to get that. And then last year, the biggest thing of the year was we called ISO back in. Actually, they came in to, to review us again. Uh, with the consolidation, they wanted to come back in, and we wanted to kind of speed it up, too, for the city to get the uh, ISO rating down. So they came in, and we were proud in 2018. They came in in the summer, and we got the word in late September, I think it was, that we got our, our Class 2-2Y. Two, two so there's 43,000 fire departments in this country, only about 3% of them are a, a, a class two or better in the class of one. So that's it in a nutshell in our history, just to, to let you know where we came from. It was, uh, you know, for no more years than, uh, than we've been in, in operation from volunteers to now, we've, uh, we've come a long way, but we've had to. The growth is, uh, has forced it. So when I came to work here in 1987, maybe 100,000 mayor, somewhere in there. So, uh, Anyway, the highlights for 2018, we got our class 2-2-Y. What I've done here is I've condensed this. My annual report that I'm going to uh, release here in a couple of weeks is 28 pages. So I've tried to condense it down to these 12 pages here and just give you the highlights. But we got our class 2-2-Y. Also last year, we were the regional <coughs> EMS service of the year with our ambulance service. Uh, last year, we were the first fire department to join in with the Cherokee County and the state utility coordinating council to you know endorse this 811 uh is it? it's the 811 phone number dig be call before you dig and i'm kind of proud of that last year we had our first chief officer to, to get their state certification through the georgia association of fire chiefs two of them got their chief officer certification and i had one to get his fire chief certification so that's part of our succession planning to try to get our guys ready that when i step down and get into that big word retirement uh, we got guys that can step up and take over our fire explorers it's in our, our report they do well every year they, they go to Gatlinburg and compete against a couple thousand uh, other explorers every year and they shine that's in my report and bring a uh, note to them in the state there's what's called a smoke diver program and a flames program the smoke diver program is a week long it's a very intense program that gets into advanced firefighting it takes a firefighter, and the flames does basically sort of the same thing. It pushes them to the extent where when you think you can't go any further, they, they take it a little bit further. You know, you don't give up. And uh, today we have uh, 43 smoke divers in our department. We had three, I think it was, three that completed that last year. And then on the flames program, it's like a Friday, th Friday evening through Sunday evening program. It's similar to that, but it's, it's a little bit shorter. And we had two guys to complete it, so... We've got a total of 25 uh, flames uh, that has completed that. So about 68 of our guys are really at the advanced level of firefighting. We're really proud to, to get to that. Last year, we turned out two recruit classes that needed, I think it was 41 recruits. Uh, what we're working for, and it's been my goal before I retire, is to get to that three-man minimum fire engine. So last year, that really helped us start that. So today, we're running three engine companies that has a minimum of three personnel on that engine. Uh, I was allowed to have 18 new positions last year, and that helped us get to that point. 
uh, we got several outreach programs we'd like to get involved with the community. We have the Ghost Out. We have several of those going on now. I think Cherokee High School is next Friday, I believe. Is it next Friday, I believe? So those are really good programs, and if you've never seen one, if you have that opportunity, I'd invite you to come out and watch one of your programs. Uh, it'll, uh, it'll choke you up, but it's, that's what it's meant to do to, to bring awareness to these kids, you know, not to get out and, and uh, drink and drive. That's just some of the highlights. So we get into our performance data. It's kind of a breakdown, and then I'll get into the, the Canton data. This is our uh, data for last year, and I've got 17 and 18 comparing them. Last year, uh, we ran 582 fires. Compared to the year before, we were down 7%. And I think you're going to see that in, in the Canton data as well. So 582 fires, technical rescue, we actually come down on that as well, from 1,700 to 1,400, 16% drop in that. Um, I'm going to the next page. This is our business right here. This is what keeps us running up and down the roads every day, is our EMS calls. In 2017, we ran 17,150. Last year, we ran 17,676. That's a 3% increase. Then other calls for service were 7,136 for last year. Uh, increase of 6%. So total last year, our department ran Department ran 26,865 incidents for the whole year. I broke that out one day, and I don't remember what it was per day, but that's, that's, that's for the whole year. Our average total response time to a structure fire last year was 5 minutes and 36 seconds. From the 90th percentile to a structure fire was 9 minutes and 4 seconds. Now, what that means, you know, better, better, just better than 50%, we're hitting that 5-minute mark. And on the 90th percentile, we're, we're at 9 minutes and 4 seconds. That's 90% of everything we ran last year uh, on, on structure fires. And then the average total response time for EMS is 6 minutes and 30 seconds. And the 90th percentile is 10 minutes and 13 seconds. The reason we're looking at that 90th percentile is we're, we're pursuing international accreditation. And the NFPA, that's, that's the benchmark, to try to hit their, their times, which is – they allow us a one minute for turnout time, which is from the time that bell goes off, we got a minute to get out the door. At night, when you're asleep for a structure fire, they give you a minute and 20 seconds. And then the goal is to get there in four minutes. So you're looking at a five minute and 20 second total response time is our goal. And that's what we're gonna work for, and that's gonna be our performance measure from here forward. You know, when determining fire stations, we'll be able to look at our areas and see how long it's taken to get to certain areas. But that's the mark that we're setting for us as a department is five minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, it's, it's pretty much the same thing for EMS calls. And you'll see where we're at there. We're off, you know, we're, we're not too far <laughs> off on the average. But when you get to the 90th percentile, when you get in our areas, like going up north in the rural areas, it, it kind of drags us down a little bit. So, But we're still going to use that as a benchmark just to let you know as a department where we're going and that's where we're at today. EMS statistics, uh, this is our top 10 calls. I asked my uh, data analysis to pull, pull us our top 10. And this is how the numbers break down if you wonder how much we run on EMS. And, you know, all, other, all others is 49%. I thought I'd see more in, actually in the chest pain area, but it's about 5% of those calls. But if, you're, if you have that interest, you can see what we're running, the top 10 calls. On transport data, Last year, we transported 12,480 people in Cherokee County to the hospital. I think if you punch that in on the calculator, that's about 35 or 36 people per day we're taking to the hospital somewhere. I got asked one time, you know, who's our, our biggest customers? And it, this year's a breakout of, of the age of the customers that we transport, and it's our senior citizens. You'll see it's about 40%. And that increased over 2017 by 2%. So that's, that's the... That's the age breakdown of, of all of our customers. Uh, most of our transports go to, to Northside Cherokee. I think it sits at about 66% if you, if you figured the numbers in there. Uh, but that's, what our, that's the performance of our ambulances and the patients that we're transporting. We see that increase every year. Uh, the transports, are, they increase. For the city of Canton, 
Last year we ran 68 fire calls, and that's down from 2017, down about 8%. You know, and you always look at these numbers. You know, you know if I back these slides up, you saw those, what was it, 16,000 EMS calls and 500 fires, whatever it was. But we can't downplay fires. You know, if you take those 500 fires and divide it into a year, we'd have one every day. So we got to keep our guys ready for fire. We can't, we don't let our guard down on that. We train constantly, but uh, uh, when I say the fires are down, they are down. But a fire's bad, you know, and it's uh, very dangerous for everybody. So we don't, we don't downplay that. But 74 fires, we come down to, to uh, 68 last year in the city of Canton. You see the breakdown there. We had 77 technical rescue calls. They went up a little. Uh, EMS calls in the city of Canton, they went from 3,000 to 3319, so we had a 10% increase. That's the biggest increase we had in the whole county when you look at all of our cities and even the county. So the city of Canton bumped us up on, on that one. So uh, we haven't dug into the data on where that, that increase was, but uh, for the year, it was 4,776 calls. The year prior to it was 4,344. Again, that's the biggest increase that we saw in in every area of the county was the city of Canton. We increased 10%. So that's numbers we'll be looking at, especially for look, locating our ambulances. Performance-wise, we've got it listed here. You know, we, our travel times, we're using NFPA 1710, you know, for that accreditation process, looking at that 90 percentile. But in 2019, 18, our average response time was three minutes and 49 seconds. On the 90th percentile scale, we were 6 minutes and 42, compared to the year before, close to the same. Uh, we increased a little on the 90th percentile. So when, when you're trying to if you make that determination, what are we basing our performance on, this is what we're using our response times. And this is what will be used when we're looking at considering uh, building new stations and that kind of thing. The next slide is our financial information. If you've ever wondered how big a budget I have to manage there. In 2015, it was a $30 million budget, and last year it was a $40 million budget, and it's probably going to go greater than that next year. Uh, I've got a note in there. The Canton uh, fee for last year was $3,586,000. That's about 12% of our, our fire fund. That was that, out of that, uh, the fire fund itself is about $30 million if you take that EMS off. And that's, that's the contribution that comes from the city of Canton about 12 percent overall on the uh, I believe the run data <coughs> Canton's about 17 percent of our of our total calls I believe so if you look don't look at a comparison for that what do we what do we have going on there's a lot going on these are the, the biggest uh, projects and goals that we have for this year uh, first quarter we did get our, our paramedic program accreditation we had that in the media I hope you saw that uh, we've been working on that three years uh, back in 2012, 13, 11, somewhere in there, the, the regulations changed on paramedic training centers. We used to train our own paramedics, and then the guidelines got changed, and then we had to start sending folks to the uh, tech schools. Well, tech schools were only letting us have four at a time, you know, two seats at a time, that kind of thing, and we could not keep up with that with our attrition. So we, we to have a paramedic training program, you had, had to seek accreditation. So that's what we, our choice was to do. So we got that accreditation. We, it was officially announced this at the end of last year, or this year. Got my dates mixed up. We finally got our accreditation with that program. That was a three-year process. So now we're putting, we're putting 20, 25 guys and gals a year in the, in the training, fire, paramedic training program, but it takes about 14, 15 months to get them through that. We ordered some new engines. We've got six engines already ordered. They'll be here after the first of next year. Uh, some of our engines are, are getting old and, and they're costing us several <coughs> dollars to maintain. We got some new ambulances ordered. That was the goal for first quarter. Uh, two ambulances ordered and we can try to order two more at the end of the year. Station renovations, uh, our station 24, we, we spent a lot of money on that station down there. This, this quarter we had some, uh, I, hate to, I hate to use that bad word, mold, <laughs> breaking out the stations, but uh, we had some, some mold uh, started showing and some uh, HVAC. Uh, problems. Second quarter, we're in two right now. The goal was uh, to get my strategic plan published. Uh, it's ready, waiting for my boss to give me the okay I can release it. 
station renovations for our eight, station 18, which is in Salicoa, and 17 is in Lake Arrowhead. Then our station nine, new construction process is underway. I know that thing, I expected to get that question tonight, but it, uh, at the next board meeting, I was, I was telling the city manager a few minutes ago, our next board meeting, we're ready to uh, award the bid for construction. We got the bids in uh, 30 or 60 days ago, and I fell out of my chair a little bit, but I got back in it, and we, we figured out how we're going to cover it. But uh, it's going to be about a $4 million station, and we had, had, had anticipated 3.3. So we, we've got it worked out, and we're going to move forward with it. Uh, hopefully you'll be seeing some dirt getting moved third quarter, but it, we're, I'm putting it before the board next meeting, May 7th, to award the uh, construction bid. We're working on a land acquisition for our 13 and 15, that's Salicoa and uh, uh, Yellow Creek, and something, a big project that's going on in the county that involves uh, other public safety agencies is our CAD at 911, and uh, they'll begin you begin seeing some visible implementation of the 800 megahertz radio system. Right now, the projection is to have the 800 megahertz radio system fully implemented by July of uh, 2020, yeah, 2020, next year. But we'll start seeing that at the end of this year, but that's a big project. It took a lot of time and a lot of planning. Fourth quarter of this year, the accreditation, international accreditation team will be on site and they'll be taking a look at us. Uh, trying to get that ready for them. Uh, we've got an expansion project for our training center. Uh, don't know where we're going to get with that. Uh, we'll be graduating 48 firefighters come November. And with that, I'm hoping we get those guys in the field better than half our frontline engine next year. They'll be at three, three firefighter minimums. So we're getting close to, it may even be more than that. It depends on if I lose a lot of people between now and then. But we may have hopefully at least 12, 13, 14 of our engines will be at that three-man, three-firefighter level. So that'll help us with that. Again, I mentioned the 800 radio system. And that is it in a nutshell out of the 28 pages that will be in my, my main uh, annual report. So uh, now I'll, I'll entertain questions. I anticipated some. Good job, Chief. We appreciate what you do, I can tell you that. So uh, anyone have a question? Mr. Grant? Station 9 will be, that's the North Canton Fire Station. It'll be directly across from where the one is right now. <coughs> yes, sir. And uh, on the 3% increase in, in EMS calls, is that proportionate to population growth, I'm assuming? I mean, do you know? I mean, I don't remember what the population growth is yeah. by the year. I was thinking it was around 25 3%. I think it. It's, it's probably very close. I thought it was very close. And, and But I see you added one new ambulance, and do you think that one new ambulance, does that make up for the 3% increase in calls? In calls? We added the new ambulance this year. We're gonna, I'm asking for another one next year. I don't know if I'm going to get there. Right. But uh, generally, we see about a 25 to 3% increase on the EMS calls, you know, and I think that's what the numbers reflected, I believe, at, 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 right. on okay. the county calls. But I've seen that 10% increase in the city of Kent. Okay. So I don't know what the driving factor is of that, if it's the uh, assisted living homes. Mm -hmm. We haven't broke that out yet, but okay. even my boss wants, wants right. to know those kind of answers. You mentioned on, on Station 9 you hope to award the bid at your next board the meeting? The May 7th board meeting. We're preparing the agenda now to and get then, approval. And you may have said this, and I missed it. I apologize if I do. What, what's the anticipated completion date of that station? We have at least 12 months. Months. On construction okay. to build a fire station. From the next board you meeting, know. which is next month or? May 7th. Okay. So they get approval, get it started into May. So get into June, probably June of 2020. Give me 14 months just to give me. <laughs> <laughs> July or August. About next 13, year. can we settle? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank Hopefully you. By mid summer, late summer next year. We can get it done, but give us at least 12 months on station construction. Uh, I think station two and three didn't take a full 12 months once they started, but it's getting all the contracts and stuff okay. signed. It just depends on how long that takes. But once they start moving there, generally it's 12 months or less. 
I think that process in between is sometimes gets appreciate. I didn't ask you that. I had a lot of people yeah. on that with me after fine. this meeting. So, but thank you. It's good. We'll news. be happy to get that one open. Uh, yes. That's that's been a long process. And uh, Miss McGrew, you had something. Thank you. Yeah, a couple of questions. Are all stations um, within five miles? You know, uh, ideal distance that a uh, truck would go out would be five miles. Uh, is the county adequately covered? We've got a couple of pockets that's way out in the county that when we run our five miles, I know one's up in the Salicoa area, mm -hmm. and we have, uh, there's one over in the east Holbrook area that uh, we, we got into automatic aid agreements like with the city of Milton, and we've got an automatic aid agreements with Forsyth that helps us. Mm -hmm. You know, if we get a fire, they're automatically dispatched as well. So right. the residents in those pockets, you know, get get that credit, the ISO credit that we have so they don't get hit with high insurance premiums. But we have identified there's two or three pockets left, uh, but it's in out in the county. There's none in the city. The city is covered well. Right. So there are automatic aid agreements uh, from Milton and where? Uh, we got automatic aid agreements with the city of Milton, Forsyth County, Dawson County, and Pickens County. So that helps cover that space. Also, how much are engines now and ambulances? I know, do you want to sit down to tell me? <laughs> we, uh, in our SPLOS planning, we've missed it. I mean, the uh, increases are, are really bad. That's the reason I had to shift and do some fancy talking with my finance director. We were uh, really only allocated two this year and two next year, but we worked some numbers around to go ahead and get six because 30% increase. The last engines we bought were 397, which was two, two years ago. These are right at 500. They come in at 497. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we tweaked some things and, and uh, paying for some chassis up front, we got it down to 483. Great. So you might as well say a half a million dollars now for a fire truck. Right. What about an ambulance? Ambulance is running us about 220,000. Thank you. Ladder trucks are 1.4 million. Mr. Grant? Some of those uh, new engine replacements that you're looking at are any of those, I assume, some of those assume for the former Canton stations? And if so, how many? Or I cannot tell you we have a plan today for the downtown station. Uh, I can tell you that I've rode these roads looking for land and, and I've actually talked to Mr. Peppers and the mayor a little bit about try, trying to find a, some land. I would like to keep, if you ask me as a chief, I'd like to keep something close to downtown right? Uh, because of uh, the daily, the population here and just the, the construction we have here as well as going up the 140 area back to the left. What's that road that washes out all the time? Oh, Shoal Creek. 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 We, we need access into Laurel Canyon. That's uh, a county road. What's that? That's a county road. <laughs> what, what he says. <laughs> Just throw that in there. That's a county road. <laughs> what he said. <laughs> Rain's hurt us up there a lot. But we need that back access from this station in the Laurel Canyon. So right now, the only idea that, you know, that, that I'm leaning to, if you want to ask me what my thoughts are right now, is we've got this space out on Highway 20. It's exactly three miles from that property to the downtown station. We can come into downtown fairly easy. Mm -hmm. You know, if the next step was to, to move that one out there, uh, that that would work. But I would still like to have something close to downtown. But uh, I could use y'all's help in, you know, mm -hmm. identifying a location. Uh, and I, I guess specifically on, on the, the new engines, are any of those replacing the old Canton engines? Not, not in these six here. Okay. You know, they're in now. We're looking at the age of the engines. We've, we're trying to set a rotation policy, 15 years front line, and then 20 years or five years reserve, and then get rid of them when they're 20 years old. Okay. So we've got several more older trucks before. I think the Canton engines are 2003 models, four, somewhere in there. So we got a little more life in those. Okay. okay. But Thank uh, you. as soon as okay. we can get to those, we, we'll be, be to them. But they're not some of our oldest engines that they're, they're doing well right now. I just wish they had a little bit more water on them. But. <laughs> you were talking about wish list of a station out 20. Are you talking about 20 east, east of five? 20 seven, east, five? the old Georgia Forestry property. Have you driven out there and seen the traffic? <laughs> what time of day? Oh, any time it's of bad. day. <laughs> and they're going to be widening that fairly soon. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's... Uh, 
you know, it's three miles from the station. Now, as far as getting into the city, you know, we look for that five miles. But when, right. when your density gets so, so dense, ISO starts looking at that. Mm -hmm. Then they bring you into the two-and-a-half-mile mark. So that's things, you know, if we went out there and still, you know, could find a, a place closer to downtown later, it'd work. But nothing's etched in stone. It's just discussion. You know, I'd like to get my guys out of that mobile unit. Um, I'll be honest with sure. you. Uh, Understand we, that. we thought we'd have something in, in at least a plan now, but I've rode this side of town and looked for property, and, and there's just nothing close to downtown. Uh, Good luck. Uh, yeah. I actually, I'm honest with you, I'd like to have that police station area right out here. <laughs> moved out of, I don't know what the plans is for that, but uh, that would be a good idea location. <laughs> That's just being honest with you up front. I think it's been spoken for. I, Unfortunately, I'd heard that. I'd heard that. But, <laughs> but something, you know, I, I don't want to get too far that way because it's going to hurt right. us a little bit this way. So, you know, whatever we can come up with. But right now, I don't have any plans. But I would like to get my guys out of that mobile unit. Right now, we can't put three people in there. It's small. You know, I'd, I'd be one of the first places I'd put a three-man engine if I could get three people in there. And that's the one I'm not going to completely rule out. I may have to stack stack another one in there, but it's going to be tight with what we're working out of. Uh, we ran some numbers, some estimates one time before as far as uh, trying to renovate that station, and they were just about at the cost of, to build a new one, uh, to really go in there and do what needs to be done to that thing. So do you spend that kind of money on a, that old building? I, I don't know. That's for people like <laughs> my commission and, and y'all to, to talk about. But uh, Anyone else have a question? Thank you, Chief. Appreciate it very Thank much. Thank you all again. It's a pleasure to be here. Too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Chief Mitchell, I believe we have uh, this March crime report and so forth. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor, Council, City Manager. I would also like to say uh, the transition from uh, the fire with our police department has been, uh, and thank Chief Brather for his team. Uh, what they've been able to do. Our team worked extremely well together out here on the on the roads of, of the city. So thank them for the work that they do with us. Um, this is our crime report for March and uh, the UCR report for March. Um, you can see uh, if you have the, the printouts there, it's uh, we answered uh, 2,146 calls for service. And you see the breakdown as far as arrest and CID cases down through uh, how many total traffic contacts we had, which were uh, 623 this month. Um, <clears throat> as far as criminal activity, what we uh, break down from our data, uh, shoplifting was our number one. Uh, we had 16 shopliftings um, in in town, which was down down from last month, and you'll see it's down from year to month, I believe, on the UCR report. Um, theft by taking was our next. We had 12 theft by taking cases. Uh, none of them looked like they were um, connected, as far as any kind of trends or patterns. Uh, accidents, uh, you can see that we had 124 accidents, which was down from February. February is 138. Um, and our um, Selective Traffic Enforcement Operations, our, our Special op Operations Division, conducted that uh, on April the 12th. Uh, they have another one coming up this month um, to where they had uh, several contacts uh, as far as traffic stops for uh, distracted driving and speeding uh, was some of the things that they were focused on and a lot of the contacts and citations and warnings that they made were as a direct result of looking at our main contributing factors and our accidents um, from the previous month. Uh, upcoming community events, um, see where it's, it's uh, Easter and we've uh, partnered with a lot of uh, uh, and worked of, of a lot of the Easter egg hunts that we've had this past week. Um, we have one weather permitting this Saturday at Etowah Park. Uh, partnering with uh, seven seven of our churches and with uh, Hasty uh, Elementary School. So uh, looking for a good time there if the weather uh, holds and it doesn't rain Saturday morning. Uh, Facebook Live again next week. One of the initiatives we've got going on on the 23rd, Coffee with a Cop, our longstanding initiative that we've had going on. And then uh, you have an update there from um, a couple of burgers we had in River Green where the subjects, uh, the suspects, excuse me, um, I don't believe I don't believe they've been taken into custody yet. I'm not 
hundred percent on that, but I, I believe uh, they haven't. But uh, warrants are outstanding on two individuals from, I believe, it was the Alpharetta area. Uh, didn't live here in the city. Uh, UCR report. Uh, if you had that before you, um, we had uh, um, our part one crimes um, year to month, and then year to date uh, down forty five percent from year to month. Year to date, uh, we're down thirty thirteen percent. Um, and you can see the property crime breakdown. If you notice, um, in the total violent crimes that uh, year to month, we're down 29%. Year to date, we're up 40%. And that is due to February. We had a uh, uptick in domestic violence. Um, a lot, of, Most of those are from uh, domestic violence situations where arrests were made or a report was made as far as uh, um, the total violent crimes. And then going down at the bottom there, the total contacts as far as traffic uh, pers uh, as well. And a lot of our focus is, again, on our main contributing factors for our accidents. So our officers are working hard on that each month. And that's all I have. Do um, you have any questions? Question? Good report. Right. Thanks, sir. Thank you much. <clears throat> okay, we have a, a proclamation here that we've been asked to uh, provide, which is actually... Uh, recognizing the uh, charter birthday for Cherokee County as well as the signing of the United States Constitution of September the 17th. And I think there are some special events planned in celebration of this down the way a little bit later on this, this year. But I will read that. Uh, Whereas the city of Canton, as one of Cherokee County's vital patriotic organizations, has been invited to support the community-wide effort in the launch of our Cherokee County Civic Reasoning Forum for the betterment of good government uh, on the city, county, state, and federal levels as adopted for promotion in Georgia Senate Resolution 529 for the purpose of defeating civic illiteracy. And whereas the Cherokee County Civic Reasoning Forum has been launched to encourage citizen participation for bringing honest, effective, and responsive government to Cherokee County, while the election process always focuses on personalities, the direction uh, process of self-government is critically essential to our Republican form of government. Constitutional officers need innovative solutions and constructive direction from all citizens. And whereas uh, concerned residents are involved in one or more of the seven patriotic organizations that provide leadership by we the people and encouraged to engage in greater citizen participation, and whereas the seven patriotic organizations within every governmental entity are known as the Magnificent Seven, including business, government, church, education, media, law enforcement, and service organizations. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the City of Canton Municipality joined together in support of the Magnificent Seven patriotic organizations within the county by inviting their respective members to participate in our Civic Reasoning Forum to promote our Cherokee County Charter Birthday Celebration, signing of the United States Constitution September the 17th, including the seven municipalities of Woodstock, Canton, Holly Springs, Walluska, Nelson, Mountain Park, and Ball Ground, along with the County of Cherokee, State of Georgia, and United States of America in preparation for and during the our U.S. Constitution founding birthday celebration. Let's make Cherokee County a great place to live, work, and play. Uh, this 18th day of April, 2019. I don't, I don't think anyone's here to uh, accept that, but <clears throat> we have one other that we added here that uh, would like to uh, read. This is uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the 50th anniversary of Municipal Clerks Week, which is May 5th through the May of the 11th. And I'd like to read this proclamation here. It says, whereas the office of the municipal, municipal clerk, a time-honored and vital part of local government, exists throughout the world, and whereas the office of the municipal clerk is the oldest among public servants, and whereas the office of the municipal clerk provides a professional link between the citizens, the local governing bodies, and agencies of government at other levels, and whereas municipal clerks have pledged to be ever mindful of their neutrality and impartiality, rendering equal service to all. And whereas the municipal clerk serves as the information center on functions of local government and community. And whereas municipal clerks continually strive to improve the administration of the affairs of the office of municipal clerk 
through participation in educational programs, seminars, workshops, and the annual meetings of their state, provincial, county, and international professional organizations. And whereas it is most appropriate that we recognize the accomplishments of the office and municipal clerk. Now, therefore, I, Gene Hopkins, Mayor of the City of Canton, do recognize the week of May 5th through May the 11th, 2019, as Municipal Clerks Week, and extend and further extend appreciation to our municipal clerk, Annie Fortner, and to all municipal clerks for their vital service they perform and their exemplary dedication to the communities that they represent. We appreciate your job. <laughs> okay. You have in your agenda the uh, draft minutes from the April 4th, 2019 meeting. Are there any changes or corrections to be made to those? Motion to approve. Second. Mr. Grant made the motion. Mr. Yon seconded the motion to approve the minute. Minute. Any other discussion? If not, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. All members voting for the motion. Okay. No one on our 10 minute public input period. Uh, the uh, consent agenda, I will read those two items. And if you want any of them pulled off for further discussion, we will do so. Item A, approval of property and casualty insurance renewal. Um, and item B, approval of the hotel motel tax fund amendment, both of which we discussed in detail at our work session two weeks ago. Anyone need information, more information on those? Motion to approve. Okay. Second. Ms. McGrew made the motion. Mr. Young seconded the motion to approve the consent agenda. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. All members voting for the motion. Under old business, we have a discussion and possible action to award a task order number 13 to Atkins for design, bidding, and construction management services for the Etowah Trail Extension and Old Ball Ground Sewer. Um, Mr. Otabian's here to uh, answer any questions, I guess. We've talked about that at length. Does anyone have any questions? The, on, the, only, the only question that I, well, it's not really a question. It's more of a personal <laughs> opinion and comment here. But uh, the only concern I have is, is when you read that, it says uh, it has to do basically with the sewer and the trail. And I believe included in that is some intersection uh, evaluation. I think we're going to look at tying access into the trail system is... Okay, so that, that intersection at Mill Way is not included in that? Or it is? No, I think what we're looking at is we're looking at the sidewalk from where you would access the trail across yeah. uh, the Waleska Street Bridge up to that intersection. Up to what is, okay, okay. So, so the evaluation of the 140 is not, extension up through there is really not included in this. I don't think no. so. No. Okay. Ms. McGrew? Will there be improvements to the sidewalk? You mentioned it. That, that would be something that they would look at okay. as, part of, as part of the design. All right. And what is the width of the sidewalk now? Four, probably four, there five feet. Five four feet, feet at the most. Four, four, four or five, five feet, feet maybe. Uh, Can we increase that width? That's <laughs> something that they will look at. They'll look Make at it width. And what we have, you know. What you say? I said it might get might get wet. <laughs> it's it's a locally controlled bridge, so some of it will be determined on which side they decide to come up, and that's why we also include that intersection in there. If they decide to come up on, say, the side of the bridge that's on the Sandy Hook side, you know, we may have to look at some type of mid-block crossing or something like that. If they come up on the side that's on the Riverview apartment side, then we may not have to look at that. It would seem like you'd want to come up on the drugstore side to me because that way you wouldn't have to cross the highway to get to keep going down the river if that's what Absolutely. we wanted to do. Yeah. Mr. Grant? So that bringing it back across, the, the main intention of that is to tie it into to downtown access 
So will it go past that intersection and up to the Waleska Street sidewalk? Is there a current sidewalk like in there front of is. AutoZone? There is a current Side, sidewalk, sidewalk on both sides, but we may have to look at the way we improve that sidewalk in that area, the connection. And then the other part about it is, you know, at some point there will be a trail on the other side of the river, probably the private sector looking mm -hmm. at that. So we may look at some type of connection there as well, um, you know, to let them know how it's going to join in. So is there currently a sidewalk like in front of AutoZone? And there yes. Mm -hmm. On that side? There he is. Mm -hmm. Both sides. Okay. I didn't remember it either, Bill, and I went and looked. So I always go to the other side because I didn't think there was one there. But. We, we have more people that tip, typically walk on the other side, but there is one there at the AutoZone side. Okay. And then you also have the railroad crossing and all of that. So that may be something that we also look at on this trail design is getting past that railroad crossing as well. You know. Okay. Great. Anyone else have a question on that? Move to a motion. Motion to approve the... Uh, Designed by Atkins for the for trail extension. For task order 13, which is sewer and trail. And stuff. Yes, so okay. sewer and trail. All right, we have a motion. We have a second. Second. Okay. Mr. Goodwin made the motion. Mr. Grant seconded the motion. Any other discussion? If not, those in favor say goodbye by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Okay. All righty. Um, Next item, discussion and possible action to accept the revised joint project agreement between the City of Camp Cobb County Marietta Water Authority for the Hickory Log Creek Reservoir Project. Mr. Tabian, still there for any questions you may have on that. Well, the, the, just, just to note that the, uh, I think we passed out a, a little different version than what was in your, your agenda packet. Oh, um, oh that's different. The, well, it's highlighted in there. It's mostly legal stuff. Um, there was some conversations or emails that went back and forth between, I didn't, I don't know, Mr. Dyer was out of town, and so um, there, there are a couple of things that yet to be ironed out, but um, this version that, that we passed out was approved unanimously by the Cobb County um, Marietta Water Authority Board at their meeting on Monday. So what we're seeing now is, is a little bit different than what we had at the last meeting? Yes. So we may or may not want to act on that at this time until we have had a chance to look at this. Mr. Grant? I was going to say the same thing, and you said there were still a couple things to be ironed out. Well, yeah, you can see they're highlighted in, in the Okay, in the but attached. they're not ironed out yet. It's, so, Well, I, how much of this was not on the last one? I mean, it's mostly the same. Or they may be asking questions or clarifications yeah, I, on I some think, of those. I mean, it's all the stuff in this version, that I guess that's what got passed out. Yes. I think it was all there before. I don't think anything's changed. There's been questions, yeah. but I don't think anything's changed. The, the issues that came up were code sections in the law and whether those code sections from the old contract to the new contract and verbiage like that, and that's why the attorneys were brought in. It had nothing to do with the content. It had to do with matching code sections. And I think the, the, the one thing they added was that repeal. I think it was article, the last article 12 that was an adder. That's correct. They did add one note in here that this basically repeals the old agreement. I think that was already in it. I don't mm, think that's a new no, one. Um, so what, what are the couple things that maybe maybe still be ironed out? Or the only other item that I know of that was, was under consideration was <laughs> there's a line in there about the backing of the payment for operations. And so it says that the city is going to use its full faith and credit as a way to back payment for operations. Well, a city's full faith and credit would mean taxing powers. The authority, Cobb County Marietta Water Authority, does not have full faith and credit because they don't have taxing powers. It says full faith and credit in there, but they, they can't tax anyone. Um, ultimately, we spend about $150,000 a year in operation on the reservoir, and we fund all of that out of the water and sewer fund. So, you know, I'm not really concerned because I don't ever see a point where the city's going to say, you know what, we're not going to pay that out of the water and sewer fund. We're going to raise, you know, the millage rate by 0.15 mils to cover that debt. You could do that under this agreement, but council would ultimately have to decide that. I think this, the only other provision, and maybe Mr. Dyer can answer, is I guess a 
judge could order us to tax ourselves if we weren't willing to pay for it out of our water and sewer. But I don't know why that would ever happen because we have an enterprise fund that covers our cost of operation on the enterprise. Yeah, I don't know why they would insist on the, the uh, full faith and credit, which would include the uh, uh, levying of property tax to make those payments because I, I would think that they would know as exactly what you said. It, I'd say the likelihood of ever having to use that would be zero. And, and ultimately, that was language that was in the original agreement. I don't know at the time if they if they were just concerned they didn't know what the operational costs were going to be and things like that in the long run. Remember when they did the initial joint project agreement it was prior to construction and so there may have been larger debts associated with it. Maybe the city's water fund wasn't doing as well. I don't know. I don't really see any issues for us today but that language is still in there. But it's, it's language that's in just about every especially intergovernmental agreements. They put city pledges as full faith and credit. I, I really tried to figure out if there was any legal definition of that. There's not. But practically it means a court could order you to raise your taxes. That's practically what, if you were in default. And I think that could happen if they got a judgment against the city anyway. So. Mr. Grant? So may I ask a yes or no question? Is this the final contract? Yes. So what, what these things in there that says comments inserted by Doug to be resolved. Yeah, that's a real problem with passing out a version that's the, but, the tracking yeah. changes. Yeah. There were some changes made. I thought you'd already seen them. If you hadn't seen them already, there were just the, Mr. Haney, the authority's attorney, went through and changed some things that were not substantive at all. They were cleanup things. I thought you'd already seen that version, though. Perhaps not. I, huh. So I guess Apparently. if you're not, nobody can tell you whether you've seen it or not. You probably don't need to vote on it yet. Mr. Hattavian said this was. The, the, there was several versions that went back and forth. and um, This was the this, latest this is, version that we had, this, which was not a clean version. It's the red line version. So Mr. Haney's changes had happened before the last meeting. So that's why I thought that was the version the council had seen. Do we have. He had already put those out before our last meeting. Oh. Okay, do we have a copy of a clean copy of this that Cobb Marietta Water Authority has signed? The, not, nothing signed. That is the, the exact version that, that Mr. Page sent us saying this is what was Why don't we to, wait till they send us their signed version and we'll vote on it? We can do that. Yeah. And that way, that way everything's theirs. like it is. Hmm? They approved theirs Monday? They approved it on Monday, yes. On Monday. So, so they can send it to us real quick. That's right. I, I had a question yes, about the section 1002, the park site. It says that the city can pick out a site for the park and that it will no longer be a part of the project, that the city will maintain that. Well, that's already been done, right? We have our park. We, we have a, a boat launch or a boat parking area. That's right. Is, is that what this addresses? No. no, it's what this is addressing is us picking out a piece of land around the park and right. actually paying Cobb County for it. In this instance, what we've done is we, we lease that property from Technology Park Atlanta, but we still have the ability that if we want to take an area of land that we co-own with the authority, we can do so. We just have to pay them the value of that land. Yeah. They're 75%. Yeah. So, so it's not the park that's there now. That's, that's not. That's this not, is for something. That's not called the park. Okay. Under this okay. Agreement. Now, if we if we had land to to purchase that wasn't co-owned, we don't even have to get their approval on it. We can just do it. Okay. Anyone else? If y'all want to wait till we get that back. That's your place. Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Signed. All right. Do we need a motion <laughs> for let's, that? Let's do a motion to postpone that until such time as we have. That. So moved. Second. Motion to second. Any other questions? If not, those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those no? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Post. Okay. Okay. All right. Mr. Peppers. At the last meeting, we discussed uh, a letter that we would need to send to the city of Waleska 
requesting that they relinquish the parcel of land that is the North Georgia House for us to be able to provide water and sewer service to the site. I'm happy to answer any questions on that that you have. Motion to approve the request. Second. Okay. Mr. Grant made the motion. Mr. Yon seconded the motion. Any other discussion? If not, those in favor of five saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. All members voting for the motion. Um, under my report, I wanted to let you know that the Downtown Development Authority voted to approve the intergovernmental agreement that you approved at the last meeting, and so they are working on uh, on a purchase agreement on the uh, former police department side at this time, and so I'll bring back information when that when that comes to fruition. Uh, secondly, I've uh, provided you a, a report um, from our code compliance office. They're doing a, uh, a spring cleanup initiative where they have uh, uh, been preparing letters to residential properties based on the property maintenance code. And so you'll see a list of 169 uh, properties around the city that have received letters. Basically, these are instances where um, maybe you have uh, broken windows uh, that are visible from the street. Uh, you may have exposed wood that's not treated um, or painted under the code. It does not apply to uh, residential properties that currently have a building permit. If it's in the, in the form of a building permit, those aren't applicable for this section of the code. Um, because we assume that there's work going on there and that it's in a stage of completion. Um, these individuals were sent the letters uh, related to the properties. Uh, they have roughly 60 days from when the letter was sent to reach back out to the code, uh, code compliance office and let them know how they're going to correct the situation, uh, give them a timeline. For instance, you could have a situation where someone is going to have to paint a portion of their home uh, to bring it into code and because of that you know we're giving them the flexibility to let us know when they're going to paint it give us the date when it's going to be done you know not put everybody under notice that you have to paint it in 30 days so to speak so uh, Merrick will be providing us a report routinely on this and how this is going um, but you'll notice that they're uh, throughout the city um, you will not see necessarily as many of these in some of the more um, some of the larger neighborhoods. Uh, I think part of that comes from the fact that those larger neighborhoods traditionally have homeowners associations that are already enforcing that within their covenants, uh, and so we don't see the same issues necessarily in some of them that we see in some of the older uh, mill neighborhoods of town or or some of the non-established neighborhood areas. But I want to let you know about that. Uh, secondly, we sent letters out uh, in April uh, to the car washes in the city. Um, there is a section of uh, code that requires um, basically a grit system uh, for the cleaning of the water that's utilized in a car wash. That's not a city code, that's a state code. And so there were some concerns um, that have come in over the past that individuals were grandfathered because of their stations had been there so long. And that's just not the case. It's a state code. And so what we've done is we've sent letters to each of these businesses. Some of these systems could be expensive. Most of our car washes already have these systems in place. But what we've done is we've basically given them this current business license year for them to come and meet with us and bring themselves into compliance with the structures that they may need to meet that state permit um, so that we can continue to issue their business license because they'll be meeting state rules and requirements. So those have also been sent out. I also want to uh, let you know that uh, next week is Georgia Cities Week in the state of Georgia. And so on Monday from 2 to 4, we'll be giving tours to the public of our uh, police department and municipal court building uh, over at 151. Uh, Elizabeth Street, you'll get to see some things behind the scenes that you may not get to see. Uh, uh, hopefully, you may never have to see at the police department. 
uh, but you will get to go in there and see the new construction uh, and some of the work that we've done over there. On Tuesday from 3 to 5, we'll be doing tours here at City Hall as well. And then on Thursday, we'll have a citywide dumpster day uh, also at 151 Elizabeth Street. Uh, we typically do our dumpster days on the weekends. We thought this time we would try one midweek and see if maybe that maybe that brings a little bit of a different customer in, gives somebody a different opportunity to participate. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. With regard to Georgia Cities Week, I will also be uh, spreading the word about Georgia Cities to Knox Elementary third graders on Monday and Hasty Elementary third graders, I think, on Tuesday. So I always okay. enjoy that. It is fun. Yeah. I, I, I hesitate to bring this up, but... When I saw this list of blighted properties, it's, there's so many. I know that some cities levy an extra tax on their, le on their blighted property, and I just thought I'd put that out there. We might want to think about something like that because we have a lot. I think we passed that several years ago. Pardon? I think we passed that scheme several years ago. So we they talked are, about it. They, we never passed we, it. We didn't pass it because it's like six times the uh, yeah, property I, I know tax. I prepared an ordinance, but we may not have. I, no, I don't think well, we didn't pass that. I don't remember it. Well, if we did. You may not have been here then. I may not have been here. Y'all must have been that I Oh, that before long. I came on the council. Yeah, I think, I think so. So they are taxed? No, 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 no. no I don't no. think we're we We were looking at various ways to deal with it. Right. That was one of the options. I remember parent, preparing an ordinance. I don't remember whether we passed it. I'm pretty sure we did not pass that one. No. What, what does protective treatment mean? Is that the exterior of a house? Mm-hmm. But you so, don't know what it is exactly, right? Well, uh, so so what Merrick did is Merrick just piled down his individual reports into a simple spreadsheet for you. But each one of these has a full case file with pictures and and examples of what needs to be done. So, um, for instance, you could have a, a soffit that's missing and exposed wood uh, that's not treated. Or you could have a situation where... Um, an individual has had some work done around a window on a house, but they've not gone back and replaced trim, and so you have exposed uh, uh, interior wood. Um, that would be protective treatment. They're supposed to cover that up. So, so this is under the, which code is that? International Property Maintenance Code. In addition, we're also getting into the season of grass. And so they're also working on the eight inches of grass and things like that. And typically what they do in that scenario is they make contact with the property owner. And very rarely do we have to issue any citations for tall grass. Most people come into compliance with that. So, What else you got? That's all I have. Uh, you know, I had someone bring to my attention today, since you brought a lot of the code stuff here about our uh, uh, smoking ordinance, and they didn't think it was being enforced. And I would, would suspect that this probably will be enforced, hopefully. Uh, do you think we could get some signs downtown that, in essence, said no smoking? The uh, uh, city of Canton is a smoke-free city or something like that, and put it on no smoking on public property. We actually have bricks that have been ordered to install on the sidewalks with that message because most people when they're smoking, they're not looking at the signs, but they do walk where they're going. And so in speaking with Scott Hooper, that was one of the things we thought we would put in place first is not to increase the sign clutter, but maybe put some signage on the sidewalks. We're also looking into some signage that we can install related to our benches. So maybe it's a, so maybe it's a placard with on, on the bench that also has the no smoking uh, uh, policy on it. Um, well, that just kind of come to light, too. I think I've seen the uh, city of Atlanta and some of the other cities around Atlanta have, have just, in fact, uh, way after the city of Canton did it, uh, it's, it's, doing about, it's doing the same thing. Yes, sir. Any other comments, questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, just a question on the ordinance Mr. Dyer was re referring to uh, about the flight tax or whatever we were calling at the time. But 
Um, would it we be? did pass it. <laughs> I pulled it up. It's it's in the code. We passed it in 2015. Could we um, put that, if it's the mayor's pleasure, on, on the mayor June work session just to review that and well, sure. discuss we, it? We, we, since we, that. Now we did pass list. that. Well, yeah, the Community Redevelopment Tax Incentive Program, Section 54-158. That's what I assume you're talking about. Seven times the... Yes. Value, is that what it was? Seven, 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 I think it was and then six. if they fix it, you you waive that or you don't yeah. charge it to us. And it's being and it's being enacted. No, we, it, we have the ordinance. We've not done it to anybody. I'm sure of that. I think we threatened it Sometimes one it time. <laughs> we may have. I tell you, we <laughs> we actually did threaten it one time, and it was related to one of our um, hoteliers, two hoteliers in the city, where we had uh, extensive right. amount of public safety calls at the hotels and we basically said you know that they needed to improve their security and operations at their facilities to cut down on the number of calls we were receiving um, or we would look at that particular ordinance and both of the hotels I think their calls dropped significantly after we reached out to them about it. I stand corrected then if it if it was adopted. I didn't I, remember I, either, but I, my memory is getting shorter and shorter all the time. You know, uh, I we, knew we, we talked just, about it. I but what we decided to do was implement the um, process where we go in and fix it, and so we have done that a couple of times. We have done that. We have done a couple of and everybody has fixed it before. We've had to except for one. We had to pull the one house down right. on Main Street, and I believe the. The issue that a lot of communities face on that blight tax is just the amount of notice that you have to give to en enact the actual tax moving forward. It's not something that just happens I, I, overnight. I think Ackworth has done it. I think they were the one of the first ones, but so, so. it's just one of the tools we have. We just haven't had to do it. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you. All right, that's all. I think that's all we have. Unless someone has anything else. If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Mr. Goodwin made the motion. Mr. Yon seconded the motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Bill, did you vote against adjourning? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're adjourned. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Do we have an executive session? Yeah. Oh, did he before I got?